I know again. Yeah. Hi, Loic. How's it going? Very well, thank you. Can you hear me fine? Just uh... I can hear you fine. How about um? How about sound? Um, Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. Excellent. Um, we'll just give people a few minutes to get uh, uh, come on board and join us. Okay. So it looks nice and sunny where you are today. It is not, unfortunately. Oh, really? uh, we just have like a 15 minutes uh, break, but no, this is just constant raining. So it's it's a great day to be indoor. <laughs> it is. It is. One doesn't feel bad sitting in front of a screen. Uh, it, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> the I'm frustration the is not there. <laughs> I'm in the UK. It's grey as well. So. Um... Mm. Right, it looks Same like for you then. <laughs> Um, so yeah, but it was cold. Um, there was a frost this morning. Whoa! Yeah. It's a good uh, way to start uh, checking if you can um, take the ice off your cars. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I think the sad stories are that we may not have uh, winters with snow anymore in the future. How come? I, I thought the oh, you mean uh, because of the climate change, right? Mm -hmm. I think that that's what I was. That's what they were saying in the news this, uh, this week. So and, we've uh, yeah. got a few people that joined us. Um, for those that uh, are just joining us, um, welcome. We're going to just wait another minute to uh, see who else might want to participate in this session from all the other tracks that are going on. And it's a, it's a full and busy agenda, so it's often worth waiting. There have been five other tracks going at the moment. So people might want to just um, be uh, maybe even taking a quick break in between those um, and joining us. Welcome everyone. So why don't we get started? Feels like uh, we've got, uh, got a few people um, joined us for this round table. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, whichever part of the world that you're in. Uh, my name is Claire Barrett at API's First Consulting and I'm um, delighted to be hosting this roundtable sponsored by uh, um, one of the API Day's gold uh, sponsors for this event, um, uh, Author or Zero. And uh, uh, this session is with Loic Loavert. Uh, Loic is Solutions Engineer uh, and the Southern Europe Technical Lead, um, advising his customers around uh, uh, um, identity access management and their implementations. Um, some of his experience that he shared with us before uh, this session is he is work scaling a video augmented reality uh, business SaaS. Uh, that's uh, sitecall.com. You can have a, a check that one out. Um, and he's also started co-founded a startup studio uh, called Liza.io. Um, so complementary adjacent industries like to uh, your your day to day business. How did you get involved in those? <laughs> So actually, uh, it's uh, I would say it's quite a very diverse uh, kind of history. Uh, I uh, I wanted to check so many uh, things in the tech world, uh, so that's why I wanted to get into video. I wanted to uh, explore so many technical aspects. Uh, that's why uh, we worked on uh, yeah Liza.io, where we had requests on yeah how would you uh, uh, actually do that solution what kind of technical solution would you put in place and now at uh odd zero uh yes customers ask me uh what is the best way to set up uh this architecture uh, how to protect their apis how to protect their applications and this of course depends on their uh, requirements right so um for those just joining us uh this is a round table um and uh, it's an opportunity for us to have a conversation um, with you in the audience as well. So well, please um, put out any questions that you have for Loic into um, the online chat uh, and uh, you know and, and join in. Um, we do have we did have a number of people, a number of you that pre-registered uh, some questions as well. So we'll uh, we'll hopefully get to get to those in the session. But Loic, to, to, to kick off, um, we'd love to hear some of your observations of what's going on in the industry at the moment. What are what are some of the 
the themes that you're that you're seeing, some of the some of the trends in this this all important um, area, which is just so um, so significant, seems to be you know in the headlines, the technical press, and even increasingly in the um, uh, I guess in the public domain in terms of the importance of security around APIs. So please. Thanks. Excellent question. Uh, I would say we have uh, uh, we have worked uh, on so many miles. Uh, if you look at any application, uh, any web service, ten years ago, uh, it would be crazy right now. You would see such clunky user interface. You would have to remember several password. Uh, you would lose them. The security issues would be huge today. So. I would say we have moved to a world where uh, trade-off try to be as limited as possible. Uh, so you have convenience uh, and you have privacy on the other side. You have security, which was historically opposed to the user experience. And today we try to bridge those gaps. So when you uh, when you have an application, when you protect your APIs and you have your users that want to access those, you actually want to make sure users can access those uh, while still respecting your security requirements. So you have to think about your user experience to make sure that it's very smooth. Uh, and if we to take a step back, uh, I want to say that we move from the, I would say, traditional uh, identity world, where it used to be more focused on the employees, uh, on the privileged users, to a world where you don't know your audience, you don't really know who is accessing your application, uh, user experience is key, trust is key, uh, you want to leverage uh, what we call social logins, uh, which means that if the users already have an account on, uh, let's say, Google, for instance, you want them to be able to leverage that uh, instead of creating uh, another account. Uh, in some use case, you may want to enable uh, magic link or passwordless so that it's very easy for them to create an account, even if uh, you, you're still limiting uh, this account uh, on, on the, for instance, on the payment part. Uh, for this part, you may want to have higher security requirement and then put in effect a multi-factor authentication. So we've really moved from a, a world where, yeah, it's a basic credential world. You have a, a username, a password to a world where it's much, uh, I would say, more complex for uh, for when you want to manage the identity, but more simple uh, for the users. That's where we want uh, to get to, mm. while still uh, being as secure as possible. So you're you're moving all the effort from the <laughs> from the users having to do the work to um, to, to to those of you um, engineering the solutions to make that available into um, more Ex of the, the bit that's invisible to the, the users. That's. That's 100% uh, correct. You want to make the life as easy as possible for your users. Uh, so yeah, so that you maximize uh, the number of users that actually go onto your app and use your service, uh, maybe buy your product and yes, uh, come back. And if, if we take the point of view of an enterprise, for instance, uh, let's say that you create a SaaS application, you're offering a service and you, you don't really have custom, not end user customer, but you have, um, other companies and you make business with other companies. So in that world, you want them maybe to have a single sign-on so that they can easily access your SaaS application without having to think about, okay, how many accounts do I need to create? Maybe you just want uh, you just want to enable some kind of a connection, uh, leveraging their, their Azure AD, for instance, so that they can just log in into your uh, application. Mm. Um no, that's um, and you and you're talking about the user experience. Um, uh, what what are some of the things that uh, some of the types of multi-factor authentication that that for those of us in the consumer world on this side of things are becoming most in use, and and how's that playing out perhaps in the business to business corporate environment that you're talking about? We really love to hear your perspectives on that. MFA is a, so multi-factor authentication, which we usually call MFA in the industry. Uh, it, it used to be. If, if we take the user point of view, it used to be something very simple. You want to access your bank account and then you might receive a text message uh, that's confirm, confirming that you own the second factor, the, the phone number. Uh, this is what we may all know, but actually MFA can be much, uh, much more, uh, I would say, varied uh, in the sense that first, 
SMS or phone are not as secure as they used to uh, in the past. Uh, today, uh, an, an SS7, which is the network uh, SMS and phone rely on, can be hacked for uh, not a lot of money, actually. So we will, we, in some use case, you, you still might want to keep those options, but you might want to uh, offer more options. That's the first part. So uh, when I talk about options, it could be uh, email, it could be uh, an application such as Google Authenticator that you may already use, but it can also be something much more simple. It could be a push notification, uh, meaning that you uh, you you want to use a service on your computer, uh, but you also have their mobile application on your phone. And as you want to enter the service, you may want to change the payment detail. This will uh, this will launch an MFA request, and then you just receive a push notification on your phone. The user experience is much simpler. So that's that's the first part is uh, allowing uh, your users to have as many uh, MFA options as possible because they may not all have the same uh, options. And then the second step is what do you want to protect? Uh, historically, people would protect everything. Uh, you think about the employee world, uh, the, the workforce world, uh, you would have a, a VPN, for instance, when you connect uh, from outside the secure network, the internal network, and you would have to do an MFA challenge when you start it. Now it's much more, uh, I would say, yeah, varied or so. You, the, the, the first part of the application, the, the home page, the basic service are not really protected with MFA, just a, a classical uh, credential or social login protection. And then you have some specific part of the application when you do admin uh, task, when you do payments and modification. Uh, all those specific uh, parts of your application, you may want to protect them. Same goes for API. You may have some API that are more open, uh, even publicly open, uh, and you may you may have APIs that are much more protected uh, than the other. So it's all about what do you want to protect and how do you want to protect? What kind of assets do you do you have? Uh, and yeah, what kind of UX user experience trade-off do you want to uh, apply? And Loic, we've been um, uh, seeing a lot in the press about the um, uh, the impact of the COVID world with people working remotely, um, with so much more um, activity happening online than anybody could have ever conceived this time 12 months ago. Um, what's some of the um, trends that you're seeing around things like credential stuffing and so on um, associated with this? Uh, and and how, how is that different and what's that, how's that playing out for people looking to architect the right solutions um, to, uh, you know, help the, themselves and their customers? Uh, awesome question. Uh, so, yeah, COVID has changed, uh, has changed a lot of things for a lot of us. Uh, that's uh, obvious. Most of us have been forced to work remote. Some were already working remote, of course, but this has changed a lot of the way we do business, uh, we buy things, we interact, uh, we, we use maybe more online service. So some people that never really use them, they are forced to use them. So what we are seeing is that uh, a lot more companies, a lot more uh, yeah, SaaS providers, for instance, they need uh, to make it as easy as possible for people that did not necessarily use online service before. So we see a big push uh, about simplicity, hence the uh, social login I was uh, referring before. Hence, so when I, when I say social login, it could refer to Google, it could refer to Facebook, it could refer to Apple ID, uh, signing with Apple, it's called nowadays. Uh, it could also refer uh, to what we call passwordless, which is a way to really use a service without having to create another account. You may just, you know, input your uh, phone number or your email address, and then you're able to use a service. That's the first step. You want to uh, enable easy ways to use your application while still respecting, uh, yes, your security paradigm. The, the other part is, yes, the, the amount of attacks. Uh, so we are seeing that actually more than half of the uh, login um, tries that we see on R0 are actually what we call malicious uh, login, meaning that a lot of people, they, they have time, they have energy, they have money, they, try, they will try to uh, get in your service. And to do that, uh, one of the easiest way today is just to go uh, online, go to 
some gray net, dark net areas where you will be able to buy, or sometimes they are even available for free database uh, that contains huge list of credentials. And those credentials, uh, they are actually leaked from service that did not really have uh, a good security uh, in place. So those credentials, they, they are leaked, they are in the internet, and they are available for everyone uh, to be seen. So if you've used the service that probably got uh, leaked at some point, you can check at uh, haveibeenpwned.com, which is a service maintained by a uh, very uh, renowned uh, security researcher. Um, and you can see that most of the service we have used, you, your credential probably uh, became leaked at some point. So people, hackers, they will reuse those and they will try to uh, breach your existing service by, re by reusing those. So we now see that some service, they try to protect against those by being, uh, being uh, preemptive and actually getting those database before uh, the bad guys uh, do it. So that if, uh, for instance, at Odero, if we see someone that's tried to log in using a leaked uh, credential, we will actually stop uh, the login uh, from that uh, person. Well, that's um, uh, really, we, we've actually got some questions in the online chat, Loic, from uh, Nicolas Dionne. Um, he's uh, asking about uh, B2B2C and GDPR. So um, very practical perspective um, for many people looking to um, manage transactions through different businesses. What needs to be in place for a scenario of one company sharing customer data with a third party partner? How do they manage consent management? And what's the link between these different parties in terms of uh, managing uh, identity access? Uh, interesting, thank you, uh, Nicola. Uh, yeah, B2B2C is, I would say, quite a common use case, uh, actually. So the, the GDPR side, I, I think, is really uh, interesting. B2B2C, just uh, to talk about that, is a way for you uh, to provide a service for your consumer. And let's say you work with an identity as a service solution, the identity as a solution uh, platform will enable you uh, to provide that service for your customer. So B2B2C or B2B2B actually is not really that different. Um, when we talk about GDPR, it's much more complex. GDPR states that you have to store as little information as possible uh, is a, in, in as few places as possible, and you have to document that very thoroughly. So when we work with customers, usually uh, Auth0, for instance, allows you to store as much information about the user uh, as you want. But this is not this, is, this goes to the opposite uh, side as GDPR. So what we will see actually is that uh, companies will limit the amount of information that is stored that is stored sorry on external services, and they may uh, use a combination uh, of um, data. So they may have, for instance, uh, an anonymous ID that they will use to uh, link the profile on an identity as a service uh, solution and some internal database that uh, they own. Why do they do that? So that they uh, don't have to lift some private information about the user on the cloud. Uh, that's a way to uh, enable that. And yes, GPR is not only limited to that, but it's also limited to, uh, it's also, uh, it also talk about consent management. You have to um, get the consent of the user. So it's very important that you make it clear what they sign up for, what they accept. And you have to use tools that allow you to do that. So uh, concept management is something yeah, you have to, to take uh, at, a, I would say, a, a strategy level, meaning that you have to make sure that everything you use is uh, compliant with that. You have to make sure that user can delete, they can modify the profile, they can get the information. So again, you have to use tool that uh, allows you to do that. Uh, sharing customer data with a third party partner. So actually you have, um, most of the yeah, authentication uh, and authorization world now widely use OpenID Connect and O2. These are the protocol in place uh, on, on the, I would say, the, the, the most used in the public web today. Uh, there is actually a flow that allows you to grant access 
uh, to uh, use the data to a third party application. So that's something you can leverage. Uh, but then I would say it's actually hard to respond uh, in yeah, 15 seconds about that exact use case. But yeah, you have the tool, you have the protocol that allows you to do that. Uh, but then I would say it still depends on your uh, exact uh, requirements. What do you want to do uh, with that third party partner? You could use this OpenID Connect uh, flow, or you could build your own uh, flow. So if, if we take a look at the way uh, you will allow a user to log in with uh, Google, for instance, that's, uh, that's actually a user that's authorizing uh, the application to use uh, the Google data. And when you will do that, you will select which part of the Google profile is lifted uh, to your application. So you may want to only select, for instance, the email address, or you could even have, uh, in, in the example of Facebook, you could even have uh, someone without their email address, just uh, their Facebook ID, for instance. Thank you, Loic. Um, I'm hoping, uh, Nicolas, that that uh, um, answered your questions. It certainly uh, um, given us a, a pretty complete complete view. Um, uh, uh, one of the things that you've, you've talked about, so bringing this sort of company view, we, we've had a number of registration um, questions that, that uh, um, the audience and, and people put in before the event, um, uh, asking about uh, um, choices that they can make as, a, as an organization about how they um, uh, invest in the right, um, uh, the best, the most appropriate um, is, you know, authentication and access management solutions. Um, what are what are some of your um, perspectives and, and learnings that your customers and clients that you work with um, around uh, how much to build, how much to buy, um, what you what you choose to do in in house, um, uh, where you choose to partner, and some of the the different perhaps risk profiles associated with that. Um, be great to hear your views. To be totally transparent, of course, I'm, uh, I, I work at R0, which is an identity as a solution uh, company. So, of course, we do uh, sell subscription. So, what I can say is that uh, we've had many requests uh, from uh, companies that usually they, at some point, they built uh, their own authentication uh, system and their own authorization system. I would say, uh, actually, most companies, they at some, some point, they go through that phase. So in terms of, this is the debate of building versus buying. It depends on what kind of uh, people, what kind of uh, employees do you have? Are they knowledgeable in identity? Uh, do, they, do they master, I would say, the flows that are used, the OpenID Connect or the O2 flows? Um, do you have a lot of experience uh, on that field? And we see a lot of disparity uh, on that. It will take a lot of time to build a solution, that's for sure, uh, because you might think that identity is quite easy. You just have an app, so you just have to uh, uh, some, somehow not the credential. You have a, a few APIs and you want to protect those. But actually, you have a lot of items uh, to think about. What about multi-factor? What about single sign-on? What about passwordless federation? Uh, I talked about social login, but you have to maintain those. You have to make sure that your app, signing with app or your Google um, connector, they continue to work. Even if those uh, big companies, they push modification, you have to adapt. Uh, what about protection, security protection, protection against brute force attack, credential stuffing attack, uh, password, um, breach password again uh, attack. What about yeah, profile enrichment, um, account linking when a user is using a social login, but also a passwordless uh, way to enter your application? So it all depends on yeah, wh what do you want to do uh, with, uh, uh, with your uh, authentication and authorization? Is that something that's very simple and you may want to use a password uh, library, for instance, which is, by the way, maintained by Auth0? Uh, but yeah, if you have something very simple, uh, you, you can get away with using uh, open source solution. Uh, you can configure and maintain a key clock, uh, for instance, instance yourself. Uh, but if you want to go further and you want to delegate uh, the maintaining the security, those service, uh, and not having them in house, you may want to uh, look at yes, external uh, service such as uh, Azure, for instance, or others. Yeah. 
No, thank you, um, Loic. That's uh, um, helpful. As you say, <laughs> you, you're being transparent about uh, um, representing the solution. But it, it, you know, these are common questions that, that people, particularly I think in the security related space, um, come up again and again um, for people. Um, I might just uh, pivot the conversation a little bit before um, uh, you and I were chatting before this event and we're talking about the trends and moves from uh, customer identity and solutions um, that help uh, consumers in terms of keeping them safe and, and uh, managing their access to more focus for organisations on the internal workforce um, related security. Could, could you shed a bit of light on some of the trends that you're seeing in, in that and um, and where people are putting putting their efforts, um, and, uh, and and what you know, with what kind of you know perspective and, and, and headspace? That's the million dollar question. Uh, everyone wants to predict the future, uh, so I, I can bring bring my uh, shine my light on, on that subject. But of course, um, and maybe uh, it may may turn out to be a slightly different uh, uh, in the future. So what we're seeing is that actually we're seeing. Uh, growing attacks. Uh, this keeps happening. Uh, we see growing pressure on the authentication and authorization uh, entry points of uh, applications and APIs. Uh, we see increasing privacy regulation. Uh, GDPR is quite new, uh, and it's uh, creating uh, all the regulations around the world, which will maybe not replicate uh, exactly what GDPR is doing, but still, companies will have to think more and more and more about that. You will see more, I would say, new technology, uh, meaning that uh, you see new framework, uh, you see new type of devices. Uh, and the last trend that we are seeing is an explosion in custom applications. Uh, in the past, some company will have a, a few number of internal applications and maybe one or two external applications, and now, uh, as you go towards the microservices paradigm, even the, the yeah, even more to the serverless uh, world, you see an explosion in the number of applications. And these applications, they need to be protected. Uh, and of course, then people also they have uh, more, 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 and more accounts. And uh, there is, you will see that some uh, users they they are getting kind of fed up with the number of accounts that they have to manage. Um, so you really have to take this uh, to internalize this when you uh, are building your yeah, authentication and authorization uh, solution. Mm. And yeah, one last trend that we are uh, seeing and that we are actually pushing, uh, but we see many other identity as a so, uh, solution uh, provider doing is an adaptive uh, way of protection. Meaning that in the past you would define, okay, do I need to put MFA for this user? Do I need to put multi-factor for this user or not? Uh, this is quite simple. This it's quite binary, and now it's much more uh, fine-grained. Meaning that uh, yes, maybe uh, MFA only kicks off when you have a doubt about this connection. Uh, maybe it's an impossible travel, uh, so you want to so someone just logs in from uh, Paris and then they uh, log in uh, from London. Uh, two seconds after. So yes, maybe it's a security issue. Maybe it's just a VPN. So you have to yeah, go into more uh, fine grain uh, way of doing uh, authentication and authorization and not just uh, do binary uh, security, I would say. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's really interesting, Loic. And and how is this um, playing out? We got um, then for for those who are trying to manage and administer this much more granular perspective we've, we've had some questions from people that registered about um uh the pros and cons of dashboarding and and you know around uh apis and you know can you talk a little bit about how this fine-grained uh requirement is is playing out in terms of the skills and tools and um mindset and head I, I mean i imagine you're much more need managing needles in the haystacks and uh, so on to um to, to be able to create this very personalized micro experience yeah. What, again, what we're seeing here is, uh, I would say, more nuance. Uh, of course, it will depend. It, it's hard to say, yeah, this solution will work for everyone. Uh, it, it always depends on uh, what do you want to achieve. Uh, for instance, if we take a, a bank, a bank will have uh, much, such a different security paradigm than a company that 
uh, that is purely uh, B2C and want to have as many users as possible. Uh, but still, what we're seeing is that uh, if, if, if we talk about the, the dashboard kind of versus API, uh, actually, they are quite complementary uh, when you want to manage your uh, your solution, uh, it could be a solution such as Audio, but it could be also your SaaS application. Uh, most uh, users of a SaaS application, of a, uh, a solution as a service application, they want to have a dashboard to quickly grasp what they can do with it and uh, what kind of configuration can they put in place. But that's really the first part. That's really when they start uh, configuring it, uh, using it. And then they, they want to move to a, another phase, which is uh, the production phase, which is the, uh, yeah, let's release this to the world now. And then they have to automate things, uh, hence the API. So what we're seeing at R0 is, yes, everyone starts using the dashboard and understanding what they can do. And then uh, they move to maybe a multi-tenancy with uh, uh, multiple, um, dedicated environment, and then you cannot, as a human, administer those. You will make mistakes. You will uh, forget things. Uh, so they move to maybe a uh, configuration as code paradigm, and they leverage API uh, to make sure that uh, what they want to put in place is indeed put in place uh, on each tenant. So I would say both are quite complementary, and you have to have a dashboard and an API or, or multiple APIs. Uh, to allow your users to administer uh, your solution. Okay. Um, so um, that's uh, uh, just seeing if we've got any more I've done any more questions in the online chat. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm conscious also of the time we're about uh, we're half an hour through. Um, we did uh, um, book um, 50 minutes for this session uh, if we wanted to keep you know the conversation going. Um, uh, but we, you know, I'm thinking that uh, un unless we've got, a f you know, any specific questions from people who are just joining us online, um, I, I might ask you a, a last a last question. Um, we had a very broad thing about how to protect. Um, so, so people who registered about how to protect against brute force attacks and other common attacks such as credential stuffing. I mean, clearly that could be a um, that's a, a, a four day three day conference in its own right. I would imagine. <laughs> in terms of the <laughs> breadth of the question, but be really um, uh, interested for, the, for, for our audience here about um, what are some of the things specifically that your uh, customers are, um, are, are using in uh, All Zero's case to uh, um, focus in on that and, and, and maybe some of the broader things that you're seeing um, that, that might be emerging in this post-COVID world um, that we'll be in from next year. Something we are, we're seeing almost across the board uh, may not be something that uh, that is uh, clear when when uh, they start using a solution such as Azure. I would say is extensibility. So you may have a use case in mind. You may have a way that uh, you want the solution to work at first, and then okay, you 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 start to understand how the solution work. Uh, it could be Azure. It could be another solution, uh, and you you have configured it it works it uh, it brings you the benefit that you want but then you as you evolve as you get more mature uh you want to maybe uh do things that are not uh possible uh or that are uh not built into the solution so in that sense extensibility uh, capabilities are uh very much important for instance being able to call external services, external APIs, or it could be internal from your point of view, APIs uh, with such a solution using serverless paradigm to achieve some specific actions. Let's say uh, you want to have a hooks that calls uh, your internal service each time a user logs in. That's a very basic use case. But if you don't have extensibility uh, points uh, in, a, in a service, it will be very hard uh, to do that. You may have to read the logs yourself and then create the behavior that you want. So having those extensibility points at the start allows you to very easily call uh, or do specific actions uh, at each time of the workflow uh, that you want. And this will allow you to really customize uh, further uh, how uh, your specific application or your specific APIs uh, work. So yeah, having a way to 
um, actually bring more functionality through extensibility is very important. And that's something we see across uh, the board with uh, customers. That's great. I'm just uh, putting a note in here in the chat that uh, there's time for any more questions. Um, uh, if anybody has anything um, specific, otherwise I might perhaps invite you to sort of sum up, um, uh, you know, your, your perspective. I know that we also have a, um, uh, uh, you know, it's a busy, busy agenda. It's a fantastic um, schedule here at API Days, and we do have another chance for, for you and I to have continue this conversation um, tomorrow, which will be um, be fun. But please, uh, maybe you could sum up what you're seeing at the moment. Yeah. I Thank you everyone for attending. So as a sum up, uh, I'd say that uh, authentication and authorization is vital to uh, every uh, API and application. Uh, they, they go hand in hand. Uh, you, it's really hard to dis dissociate them. Uh, every device now is programmable, programmable and can uh, access identity. And users now, they come from so many different uh, sources. So doing it right uh, is hard, but is important. And yeah, identity uh, is critical because mistakes can be catastrophic uh, for any business. So that's an important uh, subject that should be taken at the strategic uh, level. That would be my uh, sum up. Thank you everyone. Uh, and thank you, Claire, uh, for uh, this session. Not at all. Um, thank you all in, in the uh, um, joining. And uh, uh, thank you, Loic, and uh, have a great conference, everyone. Um, and uh, keep firing questions away as you think about it for us after the chat will be great too. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.